Um, Caitlin Rusimano is the Associate Director of Media and Strategy Marketing at Amgen. Uh, again, as I said, she came to Amgen recently in the acquisition of Horizon Therapeutics, but she also has um, a legacy on the agency side. She was at Publicis Health um, as the Media Director for a number of years. Please welcome Caitlin. Thank you. Um, so I'll give you my disclaimers today. <laughs> um, I was not allowed to include visuals, so my slides are very sad with just words on it. I've been seeing people taking pictures of slides and taking them back. I'm like, you're not going to want mine. <laughs> just a bunch of words on slides, but we'll get through it. It'll be great. I promise. <laughs> Um, so what we're going to do is exactly what Steve said, we'll talk through learning the patient language and how we get there. Um, there we go. Um, just to go into it a little bit, I know Steve really already said it, so I've been in the pharma space my entire career. So I spent my first 10 years at Publicis Health Media, first Digitas Health, which turned to Publicis. Um, and then I've been on the uh, brand side of things for about five years now. I actually first started out at Takeda and then came to Horizon, which is now Amgen. Um, and I've worked on every therapeutic area that, that probably exists. Um, but right now, um, from Horizon specifically, I have been on rare disease. Um, so I've worked on healthcare professional campaigns, uh, patient campaigns, and even for a little bit, I worked on hospital systems. So what we're gonna to talk to it about today is just effective communication with patients. And obviously, people in the room who work with patients, we know we wanna communicate with them in language that resonates with them. We wanna to talk to them in language that they resonate with, that they understand, right? So a lot of what we do also includes health literacy. So we wanna make sure we're talking to, to them how they understand it and how they wanna speak about it with themselves to the, the doctors and be their own best advocate and you know, be armed with what they want to speak about. So while some other companies may re leverage market research only, we are actually very fortunate to leverage a bunch of um, different uh, things at our disposal that we have. Um, so what we do is we take a thoughtful patient-centric approach. Um, we want to understand how patients learn, how they prefer to receive their information. And when they go to speak to their doctors, it's crucial in those conversations, and especially with rare disease, you know, these patients are going in and they're swirling, going to, you know, six, seven, eight different doctors before they're actually getting a proper diagnosis, which can take years. So what we're trying to do is educate them and also educate the HCP to make sure that, you know, everyone's trying to speak the same language, which really doesn't happen, but we're trying. <laughs> um, but that's crucial to have an effective communication in those conversations. So we're gonna spend the rest of the time on this slide. I'm so sorry, it's so boring. <laughs> um, but these are the channels that we leverage in those situations. So um, we have a bunch of different um, of these pillars at our disposal. So I'll start with social listening. Everyone knows what social listening is, right? Um, so we work with a third party that will help comb through you know, what patients are talking about in this space, how their feeling, what they're talking about for, you know, whatever the disease state is, even whether it's our treatments. Um, and we work specifically with our brand communications team. So they're really like down and dirty in it. So they actually own our Facebook pages. They own our LinkedIn's, all of those pages, which I, from talking to people while well, at the conference, I find is very different. Everyone has a corporate communications team, but not necessarily a brand communications team. So they're brand specific, um, and we have a large team that owns those conversations. Um, and they also are like in the field with our patients. So they'll go to events um, with advocacy partners, and they will talk to patients. And patients, especially in the rare disease space, I don't know how everyone else feels, but they are so open to having a conversation. They want to share their story. They want to talk about it till the cows come home because they want to make sure that other people don't have the same experience, especially if they were swirling for years and years and years. They want to be an advocate for those patients as well to make sure that that doesn't happen to them. Um, so then we also have our patient councils. And of all of these things, that is my personal favorite. Um, so we actually have these patients that the patient advocacy team or the brand communications teams go out and find that volunteer their time. So they come to us and say, I want to tell my story. 
I want to share, so one of our brands is for an eye condition, and we have a lot of before and afters with uh, pictures from treatment that patients love to share, love to consume, and they, they just want to come share them. Like, we had one council where a woman actually brought, like, actual pictures that she printed out at CVS and was like, look at what I looked like before. Look what I looked like during. Look what I looked like after. And she was just so passionate about it that I was like, this is kind of insane. Um, and I think the, the favorite part of the council for me is we meet with them about once every quarter um, and we take programs that we're doing. We take pieces um, that we're looking to create and bring them to them and say, what are your thoughts? Do you think we're talking to the patient the right way? Do you think the way we're saying it makes sense? Do these visuals look good? And um, we'll go to them and there's, there was one program we actually were so excited about. We brought it in front of them, we're like, what do you think? And they're like, we hate it. <laughs> hate it. And we were like, oh my gosh, well tell us about it. So we actually overtook the meeting. There were so many other agenda pieces, but they walked through it. We were like, we don't like the way you're saying it like this. this. This is not how we feel. And it was like actually almost collective. So we actually went back to the drawing board, did a full 180, brought it back to them, and they were like, this is much better. Um, so it's really nice to just have like that, you know, feet on the ground, being able to talk to them. And I think my favorite example with that is for that eye treatment, so one of the symptoms of having the disease is when you go to sleep at night, it's hard for you to close your eyes. So sometimes you'll just be up at night just sitting there with your eyes open. So with our creative agency, we actually did a visual where you put a piece of tape from the top of the eye to the bottom of the eye. And we were you know, showing it in passing. It wasn't even part of the conversation. And somebody stopped the meeting to say, why is it up and down? And we were like, well, you know, so you keep your eye closed. They're like, Absolutely not, you have to do it horizontal because that's the only way it stays down. And us as marketers are like, you know, we don't know that, we don't know what they're going through. And it was just such a simple thing in the moment, so then we are like, okay, well let's switch these images. <laughs> so that, you know, we, we wanna make sure we're talking to them and that other patients who are going through the same thing can relate and that we are getting, you know, to the bottom line of how they're feeling and what they're thinking. Um, so I know we talked about patient advocacy a little bit, but they partner with the brand communications team. They're another um, partner of ours internally that also goes to like the advocacy events, um, works with those types of um, partners, because especially in rare disease, they're super duper small. So it helps give them an outlet, helps give us an outlet, so they're nice to partner with. Um, and same thing, we also get patient source from that too, um, which I should say from this group too, that's actually where we found our patients for our TV commercials. Um, so it's been like really great. We'll meet with um, the team internally and they'll say, okay, this person has like a really, really good story and would be really good on camera. Um, so we'll take them from, from that. Um, and then to get to the bottom portion, the nurse advocates and patient liaisons, I know we've been talking about that a little bit the past couple of days and in one of the round tables, I think. And this is where the, the AI comes in a little bit. Um, so with these conversations, so we have nurse advocate lines for all of our um, all of our brands. So we have an unbranded number and a branded number. So they'll call, ask disease state questions, ask uh, questions about the treatment. We do not give medical advice. Um, we send them you know, to the right place to find the right information, whether it's a pamphlet, a website, or help them find the right doctor to go see, things like that. But right now, in those conversations, we have a person actually sitting there physically writing down everything someone is saying. So, which is obviously monotonous and you know not sustainable. Um, so now we're looking into leveraging an AI system that can actually listen to those conversations, pull out themes and things, so that we actually have it all in like a one-stop shop and don't have to ask you know one person from a different agency what that looks like. Um, and then the patient access liaisons; those are our partners that work with the patients once they are on script and help them you know find a doctor because. Um, you know, as with like oncology or other, you know, rare disease, it's hard to, you know, you have to travel to get to where you're, you're going. It's not necessarily a doctor down the street. Um, so they're the ones that help, you know, facilitate all that information um, and get, you know, the patients where they need to be at the right place, right time, and just help them along the way. So all of this to say, the kind of case study we were talking about is we leverage all of these um, different channels at our disposal because we obviously want to help inform all of our you know, pieces in the office or pieces on our website, things like that. Um, and the one that Steve and I were talking about is we were looking for a piece to talk to the patients in the way that they understand, but also talking to the healthcare professional in the way that they understand and the way that they would like to approach the patient in how they talk about you know, the disease state or treatment. So it's not on the slide, but we actually have 
um, an internal team that we have of a handful of our sales reps. And we'll do the same thing kind of with them. We'll take a piece in front of them and say, this is how we're going to talk about it to the patients. It's gonna have you know these three sections. What do you think? And they'll say, actually the HCP like doesn't talk about it this way. They really prefer to talk about it this way or they like this before and after picture. They hate this one. So we actually take th that into account as well. So we kind of see it on both sides, which is great to have all of this at our disposal. Um, but we were particularly looking at putting like a tabletop piece in the office that on one side would speak to the patient um, and it would have a lot of visuals, a lot of like larger wording and you know, very short, succinct, very um, attainable. Whereas on the other side for the HCP, obviously a lot more detail, a lot more information, and just kind of helping to give them prompts to have a more fruitful conversation. So in the end, this is my wonderful clip art visual. <laughs> um, we just take this comprehensive approach and make sure we're utilizing all of these resources to have that patient engagement, talking to them in language they understand, actually bringing them into that conversation so that we're talking to other patients like them um, and that we're having a really good um, clinical accuracy conversation with the HCP and with the patient. That's all I got. <laughs> uh, we, have we have time for questions though. Nice job. <laughs> I did take a picture of one slide. Oh, which so one? You know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how, how does the, what you find from your advocacy groups line up with how the media actually performs? It, it, any surprises that, that come about or is it like kind of usually spot on? Definitely not spot on. <laughs> um, sometimes like we'll have some that will like directionally like go well, but like we'll work with um, the brand communications team and they had this one program that was so, so great and it was about people almost doing like a, um, what is it, like a Dear Nancy letter or whatever, and we did Dear Ted, and it was like this whole, where you could submit a letter and talk about your um, journey and what happened, and it was this great initiative. We did all this media promotion around it, and it actually didn't do that great. Um, so there's things like that where it just doesn't pan out well, but then there's other things that will have you know, synergies with them, and they'll recommend something else, like with, um, I don't know, like a social campaign or something, and it'll like blow it out of the water. So it really depends. I, I think most times it's kind of in the middle, um, but yeah, we've had highs and lows, for sure. Since the effectiveness of this is sort of hard to measure, yeah. um, how do you then, just how do you justify whatever additional staffing and resource costs this adds to the mix? Yeah, and especially with that one piece that we were talking about today, so we would like put it in the field and then we, within weeks, had all of the sales reps calling, we need more of these, we need more of these, they're talking about it, they love it, they want more of it. Um, so then, you know, to your point, we were like, oh, well, we didn't budget for making more of these. Um, so we'll figure it out, work with the powers that be to try and make it happen. Um, but it really depends because sometimes we'll make things and they're not used and then we have a plethora of them. So it really just depends on the piece. Caitlin, thanks very Thank much. Thank you.